My name is Susie Spickle, and I am the Community Programs Director and a Naturalist at the Harris Center in Hancock, New Hampshire. And um, I am super excited about this program because I'm a dog lover. Oh, and I'm also known around town as the princess of poop <laughs> because I'm really into scat and I'm so that these two things together is perfect. I would like to just tell you a tiny bit about the Harris Center since we have some people zooming in from far away. The Harris Center is just a, a small but mighty little land trust um, in Hancock, New Hampshire, and we work hard on helping people fall in love and connect with the natural world through lots of different ways, including education conservation science, um, community or citizen science opportunities, and land protection. And if you aren't from around here and you have a chance to visit, come on up and visit. I'm going to introduce Julianne. She's, she's going to miss it, but I have so many great things to say about her. Um, first of all, Julianne is a full-time environmental researcher with the University of Washington, where they have a training program for canines, for canine conservation. She is a, de 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 pardon me, she is a detection dog trainer and an outreach specialist, as well as the co-author of a fabulous children's book, which I know I'll be buying this soon, probably tonight, called Pooper Snooper. Um, which is from the Working Scientist series. It's all about scat detection dogs. So if you have some a young person in your family who's interested in conservation and dogs and scat, this sounds like a perfect book. Her canine, one of her canine counterparts is a three-year-old, or maybe he's older by now, black lab named Jasper, who has been trained by Julianne to sniff out things for environmental and conservation research, including things like scat from bobcats, wolves, and coyotes, and even things that are actually less visible, like environmental toxins such as PCBs. That's totally cool and fascinating. So I am super excited to hear what Julianne has to say about conservation canines and dogs being used as detection in um, conservation research. All right, Julianne, take it away. Good evening, everyone. I hope everyone can hear me okay. So as I was so wonderfully introduced, I, I've, I'm a longtime employee of the University of Washington. Um, I've had a very unique job for about 16 years now. Um, I work in environmental sciences and I work with detection dogs. It's a very unique niche that has allowed me a lot of really neat opportunities to work with rescue dogs, to travel, to do field work, um, and to problem solve using the superpower of, of the dog, which is their incredible sense of smell. Um, we have always been part of the Center for Conservation Biology, and um, we've recently changed our name. So the center kind of expanded a little bit, and we're doing a lot more work um, with contraband, wildlife contraband, and ivory work um, internationally. And we are now the Center for Environmental Forensic Sciences. So that's that's not yet rolling off of my tongue because it's a very recent change. Um, but the Conservation Canines Program has been part of the center since 1997. So I have a PowerPoint here with lots of information. Um, I probably won't get through it all. Um, but I'm just going to try to tell you a little bit more about what we do using pictures. <laughs> and, um, and I do have my cohorts here. Uh, this I should introduce you to is Casey. He is 17 years old. Um, I, he is a rescue dog, just like all the dogs that I work with. And he, um, he and I were partnered to work together in 2008 on a Pacific pocket mouse study down in San Diego. Um, he was the only Jack Russell Terrier to enter the program. He and I did great for one season, but then he decided he wanted to retire early. So since 2009, <laughs> he's just been my little cohort and he goes to classrooms and visits um, with students with me. Uh, he's completely deaf and blind at this point. So he just kind of bumbles around the house like a slow moving Roomba now. <laughs> But also here with me is um, Jasper, who is the, the working dog that he's four years old now, um, also a rescue from Olympia, Washington. Jasper, come here. He's a big giant black lab come here. Um, who loves to play ball. So he has his, they got so excited hearing me talk 
just to you all that they're all that uh, he's he's all worked up. But um, he also has a little sister, a new recruit, Sochi. And they are busy playing. So this is Sochi. <laughs> Um, she is just a, uh, she's a mix from Mexico. And then Jasper, come over here. Boy, this is Jasper and he has his ball. Um, he's a big black lab. And the only thing that all of these dogs have in common is that they love to play ball. And so we use positive reinforcement training. So when we're looking for a good detection dog, we aren't looking necessarily for a dog that has an incredible sense of smell because all dogs have a really good sense of smell. What we look for is the dog's desire to play ball because it's a hide and seek game. So when we present them with something that we want them to find, the reward for them finding it is to play ball. So right now they're super excited and they're running around the house playing ball right now just because they hear me talking about <laughs> this with you all. So they have a lot of energy. They love to play ball and they are dogs <laughs> that needed homes that didn't have them before coming to us. So that's, that's what all of the dogs in the program have in common. Um, not a lot, but it is a great second chance for a lot of dogs who are in the shelter because they have a lot of energy and, and um, are maybe a challenge to, to have at home. At the center, we have a laboratory facility, which you see a um, woman here on the left. Um, and then we have the dog program. And so the canine program, our role is to collect data. And then we have a genetics laboratory at the center that analyzes the data that we collect. And I'll talk a little bit more about what kind of data that is. Um, we do a lot of different work, different types of work, all within the realm of environmental sciences. Um, it used to be wildlife only, but now we've kind of branched out and realized we can use the dog sense of smell to help us answer a lot of environmental questions. That's a picture of me in, in Banff <laughs> collecting wolf scat one summer. It was the best summer ever. Oh. There we go. So uh, here's a picture of Jasper. The conservation canine method was developed in 1997 and the idea was we want to collect information about wildlife, and we want to know how many um, different species of if we're if we're looking at a particular species of animal, for example, uh, wolf. There's questions that we might want to know. We want to know how uh, we want to know the health of the animal. We want to know how many there are out there. We want to know breeding patterns or reproductive status. Um, there's a lot of health questions and identity questions that researchers go out there looking for. And traditional methods would be to set up traps, um, camera traps, hair snares, or just to trap the animal and take a blood sample to get more information about the animal. Well, the, uh, the head of the center, Dr. Sam Wasser, determined that you could find out a lot about what the animal, uh, about the animal's health by finding what the animal leaves behind in the field. And so this program was born out of this, uh, this idea of using scat to understand the health and population status of a lot of different animals. And by scat, I mean poop. So instead of a blood sample that you'd have to go ask the animal for or trap the animal, tranquilize the animal for, we could get a lot of the same information from scat that's left behind by the animal. So this is thought of as a very non-invasive way of collecting information on an animal. So the animal that we're learning a lot about might not even know that we're in the area collecting data. We just find what it leaves behind. So here's another picture of the dogs. Um, this is Heath Smith. He um, was an early manager of the program. So he was working there when I stumbled into the program I was fresh out of college, uh, 23 years old. I thought I would do one summer of work with this program and I've been, uh, I've been here ever since. <laughs> so it, it, I, it, it, it stuck. Um, so here's a picture of Heath Smith with um, various dogs from the program. And as you can see, he's holding a ball and all of the dogs, different shapes, sizes, breeds, 
they are all looking at one thing and that is the ball. So that is the training tool. It's a, it's a really fun way to train a dog because they're just so excited about playing, playing this game that they'll learn very quickly and they'll learn how to find things very quickly in order to play ball. There we go. I mentioned Dr. Sam Wasser, here he is. Um, so here is a picture of him in Africa. Um, the bag you see, he's collecting, it's actually uh, elephant dung. So he, uh, one of, we do a lot of work with African elephants and um, we wanna know the genetic uh, the genetic distribution of African elephants. And so to get genetic information on all the elephants in Africa, you collect uh, scat samples from as many elephants as you can. And so I'll get back to this a little bit later, but what, what he's created is a genetic map of African elephants. And so when we do some work with ivory. So when ivory is confiscated, we can actually use the genetic map that we've created by collecting scat. We can map the genetics from the ivory that's been seized and actually find out where um, the ivory came from matching the genetic information. The reason we do that is because we wanna know where poaching, where the hot spots for poaching activity are taking place. So if there's a, a park that is, um, needs to up their security. Um, that's how we use genetic information to, uh, to slow the, the poaching activity of these animals. Here's another picture of some of the dogs that have come through the program. Lots of dogs throughout the years. Like I said, this has been um, since 2000, or 1997. So all rescues, um, most of the dogs retire with handlers. Um, some of them get adopted out to uh, friends of handlers or connections or people that are just honestly waiting to adopt a dog that has done some of this work. Um, up in the far left there, you see Casey in his younger years. <laughs> so our current dogs in the program, we've, we've kind of, we used to have as many as 25 dogs in the program at one point time and now we have um, just three. So we're working on a very specific project right now, um, developing a new method. Um, and so we have a very small group of dogs that are focused on just a few different projects right now. Jasper is on the left, Aladar is in the middle and then Davy is on the right there. And um, I actually, was involved in selecting Jasper and Davy. Davy was an old working cattle dog from uh, rural Washington. He was, uh, when I showed up, I was actually there to look at another dog, but um, I saw him, he was doing backflips in, he was doing backflips in his kennel and just going around and everyone called him the crazy dog. And he had been there for a couple months and he is, he is such a, he's a working Kelpie dog. So he, he has an incredible amount of energy and an incredible amount of focus and putting him in a kennel facility for a number of months just almost drove him insane. Um, so I didn't know if he would work, but I took him home just because I thought maybe I, we could find a home, even if he wasn't going to be a good detection dog. Um, he's, he's a great detection dog. So it worked out really well, but he has a lot of quirks that makes him challenging because he was born and bred to work hard. So if he doesn't get out and run five miles every morning, he is kind of a <laughs> kind of a head case. But that's what we love about these dogs. They all have their different personalities. Um, and while some of them are a challenge, once you give them a job to do, they find the purpose and they have the outlet for their energy and they're incredible. They're incredible animals. Um, Aladar was a search and rescue dog that flunked out of the program down in California. Uh, he was found tied up outside of a house um, in Utah. The Search and Rescue Foundation saw potential um, in him. So he went through a majority of their program and did great, except for the final phase of the program. And that was um, to find strangers hidden under the rubble. So he excelled at everything, but he has stranger danger. 
because he was abused as a, a younger dog for the first three years of his life. We don't really know much, but he was definitely um, maltreated. And so he, he did great in the search and rescue program until it came time to approach strangers and dig them out of the rubble. He just, he did not think that that was a safe thing. Um, so they contacted us. They said, he's great. He's really great at finding things. He has the great drive. He's just afraid of strangers. So a lot of the work that we do is in remote areas or in um, safe enclosed facilities. So we offer a great outlet for dogs who have maybe some social issues uh, or trust issues, but um, have the drive. Uh, Jasper is just this easy go lucky friendly guy who I work with because I do outreach education and I do PCB work in the downtown Seattle. So I selected him um, for his congenial nature as well as his uh, drive to work. So we have lots of different personalities in the program and they each serve a special purpose. Okay, so um, there's some main, um, oh, I already found a little typo there. There's four different um, categories here, it says three twice. Uh, so I'm gonna talk more about the SCAT detection work tonight, but we have in the program now started using the docs for lots of different things in the field of environmental research. Um, pollutant detection is something that I work with Jasper on. Um, SCAT detection is kind of what our, what our specialty has been since the beginning of the program. Um, contraband detection is something that we're developing and working on right now. And then there's a lot of different ap other applications that we've used in the past. So people will come to us, researchers say, hey, this is what we're looking for. We're having a hard time finding it. Do you think dogs could help us um, find it faster? And uh, we say, sure, perhaps. So that's where my passion is to do the pilot studies where we go into a new situation, we work with the, the researcher and see if we can uh, problem solve and find ways that we can use the dogs to help them get the information they're looking for. And so that has been um, anything from finding, snipping sea turtle uh, eggs that are deep under the sand um, Jasper and I worked this past summer looking for um, frog egg masses that float on the surface of the water but are hard to see. Um, and um, we also have done plant detection work. So we are able to find little tiny seedlings of an invasive plant species for it, uh, before it gets to the seeding, the stage where it seeds and disperses it all everywhere. So lots of different things. If it, if it exists, it probably has, we used to say if, it, if it's organic, it has an odor and the dogs can find it. But we're realizing that that's not, true. everything seems to have an odor that the dogs are able to detect. And so the possibilities are limitless. It's just up to us um, using our imagination and our getting creative in how we do research that we are finding new ways to use the dogs um, in this really, really, cool way of, of finding information. And to the dogs, it's fun because it's just a game of hide and seek for them. So it's, it's definitely a win-win. So the basic process of this is um, when we're out in the field, we're walking with the dog and uh, the dog is sniffing around. So this is a picture of Samson. Samson is a black lab, looks very similar to Jasper. I worked with Samson for 11 years. So he worked, uh, he loved his job and he worked up until the ripe age of 16. Um, he passed suddenly um, at the age of 16, but he was working right up until the end there. So this is Samson and I, uh, we were doing wolf research here. So we're walking a road and Samson is just kind of sniffing around. Um, this next photo shows Samson detecting something and the way that the dog communicates that he's found the target is by sitting. So a lot of times the dog might be way far ahead of us. So when they sit, they're just patiently waiting sometimes for us just to catch up with them. And then when we get to uh, where they are and if we can't see what they smell, we say, show me and the dog will point to the target with its nose and then sit again. 
And so he's waiting at this point for me to confirm that he's found what we're looking for, that I see what he's found. And then he's waiting for this. <laughs> so he's waiting for the reward. And I love this photo because you can see, um, we call this the crazy eye. Samson is uh, so excited to re receive that ball. Um, we were on a photo, sh we were out with a photographer this day and we were finding lots of scat. So he had probably been rewarded at least 200 times <laughs> that day. And every single time the ball came out of my pocket, he was just stoked, um, just incredibly excited. Samson was so ball crazy that if he saw anything that was round, his pupil would actually dilate. So it was an actual physical reaction. He was addicted to playing ball. So he, he yeah, he loved it. And he would never get tired um, of the reward. And so some people will say, well, why don't we use um, treat rewards? And treat rewards work well, but if we're out um, doing long days and we're feeding them hot dogs all day, at the end of that day, it's gonna be a lot of hot dogs in, <laughs> we're gonna have to carry a lot of treats and they would eventually get tired of the same treat. These dogs do not get tired of playing ball. So it's, we call it an insatiable drive. Um, and so for Samson, definitely an insatiable drive to play. And then the final photo is just me collecting the scat. So I'm a happy camper because I've got data. It's in a Ziploc bag, which we then will bring back to the field house, put in a freezer, and then eventually bring back to the University of Washington for them to do DNA analyses on. Um, and then he's just kind of hoping and praying that I throw the ball for him one more time before we head out to find the next target. So that is the process. And it goes, happens over and over and over again. Sometimes we're doing studies where we're looking for a target that's really, really hard to find. So we might have a day where we hardly ever find what we're looking for. And then it's my job as a handler to put out um, training samples. So at least they get some fun time playing um, a reward for, for finding something. But there are many cases where we're looking for a target that's so rare that um, the dog has to just have the drive to hunt for a long time, even though the reward may be far and few between, few and far between. Uh, so I mentioned uh, the pollutants. Um, I'm going to try to quickly go through this. This is a picture of Jasper and I in downtown Seattle. Um, this is an urban study. We do a lot of really remote, cool wildlife work, but this particular work is done in the dirty, grimy corners of Seattle. Um, and Seattle Public Utilities approached us several years ago. There is a, um, a, a pollution problem. Puget Sound was having, uh, there's a super fun cleanup site where PCBs were spilling out into the Puget Sound. PCBs, um, poly, polychlorinated biphenyls. Uh, they are a pollutant chemical that are known to be or thought to be odorless and invisible. So Seattle Public Utilities, like if we could, they take samples all over Seattle and they analyze the samples. And if a sample comes back um, to be high with PCBs, then they know they have a problem. But they thought, could you train a dog to show us where the problems are so that we know where to sample? And then we can use the dog to help us figure out where the PCB pollutants are coming from. And so we did a pilot study in 2017 with um, Samson first, and then we continued the pilot study with Jasper this more recently. And um, it's amazing. They can smell this chemical that we cannot smell, and they can point us into the direction of where, where the pollutant's coming from. And so the pollutant, it, it was manufactured back in the, between the 40s and 70s, um, put into paint, caulk, um, lubricant materials. It's not produced anymore, but it's a persistent chemical. So it never degrades and it's still in building materials throughout the older areas of Seattle. And so what Jasper can do is he, he goes along the buildings and he will actually search a building and he'll point out with his nose uh, which building has PCBs uh, and then what part of the building material the PCBs might be leaching from. Um, 
We did lots of studies. We did blood tests before and after to make sure the dogs wouldn't be exposed to any uh, dangerous chemicals. Um, so we did a lot of careful testing and we did um, careful bench testing just to test the success rate and, and uh, the dogs were incredible. So they can detect it uh, almost 100% accuracy at 0.1 parts per million concentration. Really, really low. Um, and so this is a new, uh, a new tool that we're using in Seattle to try to crack down on um, this problem. Here's a picture of us uh, sniffing around um, Seattle. This is the team of folks from Seattle that we were working with. Um, a lot of times we, the dogs would, smell something and then we have to go in and try to figure out what it is that they are uh, maybe trying to point out. And what we realized over time is that sometimes we can smell the chemical that is thought to be odorless. And so what the dogs are teaching us is that we actually can, um, there, are, there are signs that we didn't know existed before that we're learning about now. So now I can smell like PCBs and I know where there's an issue. Um, and we didn't know that until the dogs went out there and we started to work with the dogs to try to understand what they were, what they were discovering. Um, this picture down in the right, bottom right is Jasper. Um, a tricky situation. This is a cinder block building. It covers an entire block. Um, and the whole building is covered in a thin coat of of paint that had PCBs. And the paint looks great. PCBs are, was, it's a very effective chemical because it stops the material from breaking down. So some of the caulking that has really high PCB levels, it looks almost new, even though it was in, it's been there since the seventies. And this paint, um, uh, just a low level of PCBs, but covering the whole. So at first, when we walked up to the building, it was a new challenge for a dog because there isn't one target. What if the target is this whole building? How does the dog show us that? And so it's been a process of learning from each other and me just kind of doing, I call it the dance where we go in and out of an area and I just watch the dog's changes of behavior and, and watch him try to figure out, okay, he smells it, but then it's a problem solving um, of like where he, him trying to determine where the source is and then me watching him and and trying to relay the information to the people who will be doing the cleanup efforts. So it's kind of a, it's a it's, we call it the dance. <laughs> Oops. So back to SCAD, I already, I'm not gonna spend too much time on this because I did go through um, the, so, so pollutants, SCAD is like I said, the, the, the target that we've done a lot of work with since the late nineties. Um, the really cool thing about SCAT is that you can get just so much information. So that goes back to what I was mentioning about the non, um, the non-invasive uh, technique, but also just the incredible amount of data that you can get from collecting a discarded material. Um, this is just a quick list of some of the studies that we've done. So um, Jasper is trained on at least 15 different species of wildlife scat at this point in his young career. Uh, Samson was trained on more than 30 different targets. Um, and this is just a sample. This is just a subsample of some of the projects that we've done. But um, yeah, the, the possibilities are endless. And um, I do have a sample of, where did I put it? I have a sample of um, Pacific pocket mouse scat and I don't know if this camera will detect, be able to pick it up, but the, the scat of the Pacific pocket mouse is smaller than a sesame seed. So the mouse itself is one of the smallest species. Um, maybe I can get it on a piece of paper. Um, the, the species is very, very, let's see. Oh, the, does that come through at all? Yeah. So it's so small. The mouse species is one of the smallest mouse species. 
and and that's the project that Casey did actually. Um, they thought it was an extinct species. They um, and Camp Pendleton down in in San Diego. Actually, there we go. Here we go. <laughs> I have a slide about it. <laughs> um, so there's Casey in his younger years. So they thought that this species of mouse was completely extinct. Um, but Camp Pendleton, if you fly over Southern California, you see this big, like everything is developed except this big area of land and that's Camp Pendleton. So while there's a lot of artillery practice, boot camps, um, a lot of activity going on, it's the only undeveloped um, habitat in Southern California. So Camp Pendleton is the home to uh, quite a few endangered species. So there's quite a bit of wildlife research that happens there. And we were one of, of many that were trying to um, determine how many Pacific pocket mice lived on Camp Pendleton how big their population was and how, how wide ranging, how far it went. And so Casey was trained to find the scat. And, um, and then we had the problem of trying to see or find what the dogs were able to smell without problem. So there, this, this study represented one of the limitations where it's, the dogs can find just about anything, but can we then follow up and find what they're showing us is out there. And so, we spent a lot of time with our nose in the sand looking to find, to collect the scat that the dogs could definitely tell us there. So what have many studied. Um, here's just some quick, I'm just gonna go through some photos of some studies that did. This was the first study that I did um, with Samson, um, Pacific Martin, Martin, um, Mink, the mink work we did in upstate New York, and we we're actually collecting mink scat, which they did PCB analyses on. So uh, to find out how much PCB contaminations are in certain rivers, you can actually collect scat of the animals that live there and determine if there's pollutant issues there by, by collecting and analyzing the scat of the animals that eat and live there. So that's what we were doing there on, along the Hudson. Swift fox, the cutest, uh, the cutest animal I've ever worked, uh, researched with. Uh, Texas A&M hired us to come down. They had, let me move this out of the way so you can see. They, they knew that there were swift foxes out there because they'd set up little camera stations with scent discs. And scent disc is just pheromones that draws the foxes in. So they had pictures of swift fox, but they had no idea where the swift fox were burrowing um, and where the den sites were. So we went out there, we got the information from them where, where the foxes were caught on camera, and then we just searched. And within an hour or so, Samson found is the first den site that they, and so we were able to then understand better this endangered species, where, uh, where do they den? Like what, what kind of habitat do they need to successfully breed? Um, and then the idea was to educate the local farmers about how to um, have grassland that you do harvest, but how to make it also habitable for species like the swift fox. Um, so it's kind of a, a cool project where we're working with ranchers. Got too many computers. Hemez mountain salamander. Um, this was one of my favorites. We were trying to um, figure out if there was a way to determine uh, the Hemes mountain salamander is extremely rare species. It lives in underground and in rotten logs and is really hard to find. And to get a population estimate, they would have to go and rip the logs apart just to find them. Um, and so, uh, the Nature Conservancy hired us to see if we could use the do scent detection work. And um, the, it, the answer was yes, because Samson and I found 11 um, salamanders were in a month and they had five people out for three months and they only found, I think three or four. But the challenge was to prove the dogs could find it, you had to find it, right? So then, so it, so um, though, again, it presents every study has a challenge. So it's like, well, to prove that the dog is 
finding it, you have to locate the scat and so, or the, the salamander. So there were things that we still need to work out because the goal was to just not have to prove that they're there just to, to have the dogs indicate and then protect the habitat that they're in. But we did two years of that. And um, it was, again, just really great to go somewhere new, new work with different conservation groups and understand the research that's going on out there. Uh, lots of carnivore work. Um, our center has done lots of wolf research work throughout Washington um, and then here in Canada. So lots of backpacking, long days. Um, on, this, on this particular study, we just took swabs, like we would take toothpicks and take a sample of the scat and save the toothpick. And that had enough DNA on it. So we could get a, an idea of how many wolves were in the area. And more importantly, we were trying to find out um, the predation of the elk. So um, was it bear or wolves that were having the highest impact on the elk population up there? More carnivore work. This is the study that we worked um, on in Washington quite a few years with our crew. And then this one's fun. This one you can look up. Um, and I want to put the contact, oh, I want to give contact information on the woman here in the middle, um, Deborah Giles. She's an incredible whale researcher. She's worked um, with the resident killer whales for years, over 20 years. Um, we trained a dog to detect the scat of the resident killer whale that floats on the water. And it only floats for a few minutes because they eat salmon and it's high fat content, so it floats and then it sinks. But if you can have a dog out there that can direct the boat, if it can smell it, it can smell it from a nautical mile away and the boat goes right into the wind, collects a scat sample. We get so much information on the breeding, um, the reproductive health of the resident killer whales, PCB levels, in their body, um, stress hormones, lots of that. Um, so we're learning a lot about a species of whale that is having a really hard time reproducing successfully. Um, and it's incredible how much information we can get from this sloppy snot looking stuff that floats on the surface of the water. Smells like salmon, uh, so it's not too bad, but it looks disgusting. <laughs> So Eva is Giles' dog who she trained, her pet dog, she actually trained to do the work. Before Eva, it was Tucker, which was a black lab that we had in the program that was the first dog to, to successfully do this work. Um, there's lots of fun media out there on this work. So if you Google whale dog or whale scat dog, you find a lot of information. Giles works for a company called Wild Orca. They do the research under that organization now. And I highly recommend um, looking them up because there's, there's a lot of really cool stuff associated with this project. Okay, well, I'm gonna pause. I think I'm gonna see it's five. I'm, I'm in Seattle, Washington. <laughs> so I'm like, oh, okay. So I wanna make sure we, yeah, we are- we do have a ton of questions. I have I, I to saw say, questions coming in. So I want to pause because I have, you know, lots of other things to talk about, but I could talk about what we do for probably a few weeks. Honestly, <laughs> there's a presentation for each project. Um, and I usually kind of slice it down to a few, but, um, but I think it might be good to pause and take some questions. And then if we have some more time, I also wanted to get out the ball and see if I can get Jasper to do some crazy little <laughs> demonstration of that would be so cool in well, my we, humble home. <laughs> yeah, we have a lot. Of, this is probably your talk has probably been the talk that's generated the most questions that we've ever had. It's so great because I think you just sparked a lot of curiosity. But one question that keeps coming up is if you train a dog to be able to key in on a variety of different scat odors how do they know which scat that that which scat you were looking for on a particular day so for jasper if he's trained to recognize you know 15 different animals how does he know that today's wolf day that's a great great question and um the answer is pretty simple um so we have done so we call it differentiation so it, 
to ask the dog to differentiate between wolf and um, cougar scat is uh, they they know the difference, but a communication barrier is our major issue. Just, you know, it's like, well, yeah, we're working with animals and the poor dogs, I say this all the time, they're so patient because a lot of times they're like, they, there's so much more intelligence when it comes to smell. And I can't even like, I try to imagine what it would be like, but I, I don't, I don't even come close. So while they can differentiate, we have trained the dogs to, we did a very brief study where it was like, the dogs would bark at spotted owl pellet and sit at a barred owl pellet. Um, but we ended up just deciding that it was more efficient to just be very aware of how we train the dogs and what kind of species we layer um, onto the dog. So um, for example, we have, uh, so the Swift Fox study, Samson and I did Swift Fox. There's lots of coyote out there and um, the swift fox scat looks a lot like coyote. So even though Samson can tell the difference, I wouldn't be able to tell the difference and he wouldn't necessarily know how to communicate the difference. So we were just very careful about what we send a dog out there to find. Um, so a dog that is a swift fox dog, we would just make sure that maybe we don't put them, we don't train them on a lot of other species that might interfere. But if their dog is doing a, um, but sometimes it doesn't matter because it's such a rare species or, oh, a jaguar. Uh, yeah, we can train any dog on a jaguar and they can go down and then we can train them on cougar up here. Geographically, we're never gonna have that. What's, which, which one do we think this is? But I, so we used to be very careful about that. Um, but after doing this work for many, many years, what I've come to realize is that um, we can set we can set a precedence at the beginning of each day. And as long as I know the difference, so we, we get into a routine. So I won't mix up studies. We do like three months of one study and then we call it and then we do another study. So the dog understands that it, once we start a study, we're gonna be looking, we know what we're looking for. And when the game changes, I do training, I introduce the different topic. We might even set out a scat that we don't want the dog to find. It's called a um, non-target training. And they're so quick, they're so quick to understand. As long as we communicate that, there's lots of different ways of avoiding um, that, that problem of having a dog trained on too many species at once. It is still something that I, it's probably the number one as a handler and trainer, I have to think about that um, first and foremost. If we train the dog on this target, how might it in a, a affect other studies that we're currently doing or other studies that we might do in the future? And so um, usually you can figure out ways around it, but you do have to be very careful. Um, I did train Samson off of coyote because we did a carnivore study where they wanted us to. And so I, I took them to an area that had lots of coyote and no swift fox, and I can find those areas. So then I'd run, he'd, at first he'd hit on him and be like, hey, and I'd be like, thank you, but no, thank you. And I just wouldn't give him the reward. So then he was like, oh, you don't want me to find coyote right now. I'd be like, nope, I don't. I'll let you know when I do, but right now I'm gonna set out the sample of swift fox and I'm gonna reward you for that. And he would get, he got it. Um, but you have to have so a lot of cool. trust then in the future that if things get hard or confusing that, that the dog isn't gonna revert back to something or, or try to show you. And so it, it requires trust and communication and just a lot of um, working together. That is so cool. And this is kind of a related question. And somebody was wondering about the pocket mouse. So if the pocket mouse was thought to be extinct, how did you train the dogs to recognize the scent of it when there might not be the scent of it around? Good question. Yes. So getting target, getting samples to train with is another one of our big, when we're talking to, when we're talking to a possible researcher who we're going to contract with, we need to know that there are training samples available. Um, and so with the Pacific pocket mouse, 
They knew that the species existed because someone accidentally trapped one while looking into uh, when doing research on another species. So they had a trapping system already set up throughout Camp Pendleton. So when they realized there was a pocket mouse, they and they realized they wanted to hire dogs to find more. Then we had a wait period. So they kept setting the trust out and everyone who found a Pacific pocket mouse uh, in a trap was then told to collect the scat in that trap. Um, and so, and we had to be very careful that it was that we were training the dog on the correct scat. So we even might get it DNA analyzed before we train the dog on it, just to make sure. Um, and so that is one, so we need to make sure that whoever's giving us training samples, that we either have DNA proof that it's what we're looking for or photo evidence that where it shows the animal, like uh, the target animal on video or something, wildlife camera actually, and that we trust that the person collecting that, because we, we need to know that we're training the dog on the right thing. Oh my gosh, that's so cool. I, I mean, we have so many questions. We're having to spend an hour I, asking I, I need to stop talking so much to you. I'll give you answers. <laughs> right. Well, I just have to give a shout out to somebody who's asked a lot of really great questions. And that's Zenya, who has been a member of the Harris Center's Lab Girls program, which is a program for middle and high school girls to encourage them to stay connected to science. And she showed up to this and had a great question that I wondered about because I recognize some of the, I know you use rescue dogs, but are there certain breeds that you look for when you go to a rescue? Or is it more that you're looking for um, like certain behavior? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so in the past, um, we did, so short answer is no, we are not breed specific at all, but there were issues when we were doing a lot of international work, we couldn't fly with breeds that were like listed as dangerous breeds just because the airlines would limit that. So travel was limited. We also did end up considering breeds a little bit because we had so much experience with um, certain breeds just not having, um, like they would get paw injuries or skin abrasions, thin skinned breeds. So the really with um, very, very light coats. So outside of little things like that, no. I mean, we, we adopted Casey and we had never had a small dog in the program and he doesn't retrieve, but he did have a specific drive that we thought we could, you know, gear. Um, it's mainly personality, honestly, um, and energy. And again, just the tenacity, like a, a stubborn, a stubborn dog is also a good dog um, too, because they know what they're looking for. And once you train them correctly, they're gonna, they're gonna do their job and not ask you for permission <laughs> all the time. Like we used to say some of the dogs that came into our program were overtrained, meaning they were so busy asking, like, what do you want me to do next? Heal, sit, like that they didn't know how to go search on their own. And so we'd have to like untrain them to like give us like, no, take some space, do your, uh, a real good scent dog travels back and forth perpendicular to the wind and isn't, isn't stuck by the side of the handler. So um, yeah. Man, right well, okay. it's important. So, you know, um, you're in Seattle and a lot of the people who are here today are New England and Northeast focused. And we are all wondering if there's any program like this in the Northeast, or is there a future idea for a program like this in the Northeast? There are so many individuals that are um, popping up doing the work. I just being on Instagram is actually where I learn the most, like an, a new page pops up with a group doing stuff. But the main groups are Montana, Washington, and I work, the co-author or the author of the book that um, the children of, she's in, she's in the Eastern US. And um, the same thing has popped up. Like there aren't programs that I am aware of, at least at this point that are large enough for me to be aware of that are based out of, um, out of the East Coast. But I can look into that. I, sh I probably well, should. 
So I, I kind of remember when um, this kind of popped up on my radar back, I kind of close to when it started in 1997, I started to read about it. And I remember there were, were there ever times where there were training sessions offered to people at the University of Washington? I know that um, there's a couple of people in tonight's crowd that have dogs that maybe are you know, have this capacity and they're wondering, is there, is it ever too late to start a dog on training like this? And if you have a dog that you want to train like this, what, what could you do? What should you do? Where would you go? That's a great question. So I, I was, I was trained under a very unique, like, so Heath Smith, who is the picture of the fellow holding the ball, he had his own style and way of training training. So I learned, I didn't have formal dog training experience. Um, but now as I've gotten, as I've been doing more work, I've been getting more and more familiar with nose work, which is a prevalent, um, fun activity for dogs and handlers. So just looking up, there's lots of different nose work, um, training programs available online and there's nose work training groups. Um, and that's where you train the dog. So usually it's essential oils or something, but that and clicker training and stuff, that's a very formal way of doing exactly what we do. Um, and, but it's also very accessible to everyone. So it's something that you can use treats if you have a treat motivated dog as a reward or a toy. Um, and what I, I just, I just took a few minutes with, a uh, a researcher for the bullfrog study, um, her dog loves to play ball. And so I just took about 10 minutes working with her dog to see if her dog would like be able to do some detection work with the egg mass stuff. And um, yeah, it's, it's very, it's, it's a, to teach association, all you need is a dog that wants something as a reward. And, and so it's quite easy. And what I started doing was I just for fun, I trained Jasper to find um, deer sheds when we're out hiking, just because it's fun for him to do and it's fun to find those things. And so um, a lot of times it's as easy as um, just putting the object that you want to train the dog to find on the ground. And um, for me, I just get excited about it. I'm like, oh, this, this is cool. And I put it down. And, and if I have a toy or a treat, it's, um, and I withhold it, the dog will, it's, it's quite amazing. The dog will try to figure out what it needs to do to get the treat or get the toy. And it, it's just, I think it's called shaping, but it's where the dog tries doing a lot of, a, a lot of different things, seeing if, okay, I'll sit. No, nope, that doesn't work. I'll lay down. Uh, and if you point to the object that you want them to find, sometimes that does the trick and they'll be like, and, and you give them a reward. And so they will pretty quickly learn that, oh, I just put my head close to that thing and I got the reward. So let me try that again. And, and you get closer and closer. And then you ask the dog to do the same thing and you give it a sit command. The dog will sit and you give the reward. So it's, it's a fun, not too complicated process to learn. Granted, I've done it for a long time, so it seems pretty easy to me. But it, wow. it's Julie. just a way of communicating. Yeah. I am I'm just paying attention to the time and I always like to no, try to, so I know, I feel like you might have to teach a class or come, we might have to do a whole series. We, we, this was absolutely like so fascinating. And I know that the people who were here, you just really made everybody so excited and so curious and um, I'm just so grateful. So I'm going to say thank you. I know that there's more and I'll be in touch with you. And maybe we'll schedule a second one of these with you. Yeah. And I go also deeper. Be happy to answer any questions that we didn't get a chance to. So I can follow up if that. Sure. Well, what we can do is we'll send when we send out the um, recording of this for people who, um, you know, who attended tonight, um, I will um, include, is it okay if I include your email? We can, we, we talk about that. But if you had other this more specific questions for Julianne, then you can contact her. And I just want to say a, a huge thank you to you and to your dog and Jasper. to the whole program. Yeah, let's say goodbye to Jasper. Jasper. He's, get, sure. he's coming. Oh, he's a big boy. <gasps> Here he is. 
Jasper, keep up the great work. You too, Julianne. <laughs> it was such a pleasure. And thanks to all of you tonight who came to hear this totally fascinating and inspiring work. And Julianne, a lot of people are thanking you in the chat saying how great this was. So more to come. Thank so you. Yes, we can continue it at another point because like I said I could talk about this for years <laughs> yeah, well we're, we might have to come out and visit you have a road trip that would be great <laughs> or next time I'm out on the east oh coast. oh my gosh if you come to the east coast you can, can yes a, yeah we can do a demo in real life which is way more fun don't even get me started I'm so <laughs> excited about that idea all right well on that note good night everybody and happy happy days to you and Jasper Julianne may, may you have many great research days ahead of you good thank night you. <laughs> goodbye thank you so much for having us oh thank you bye <laughs>